at Idaho Public Television. Now, before I introduce our moderator for tonight's event, just a little bit about this project. Native America is a major new four-part PBS series that debuts next Tuesday, October 23rd at 9 p.m. It challenges everything we thought we knew about the Americas before and since contact with Europe. It travels through 15,000 years to showcase massive cities, unique systems of science, art, and writing, and 100 million people connected by social networks and spiritual beliefs spanning two continents. The series reveals some of the most advanced cultures in human history and the Native American people who created it and whose legacy continues unbroken to today. The series explores this extraordinary world through an unprecedented combination of cutting edge science and traditional indigenous knowledge. It is Native America as never seen before, featuring sacred rituals filmed for the first time, history changing scientific discoveries, and rarely heard voices from the living legacy of Native American culture. Native America rediscovers a past whose splendor and sophistication is only now being realized and whose story has for far too long remained untold. Public Television, Idaho Public Television, was one of a handful of stations selected for an outreach grant to extend the impact of the series, and tonight is part of that effort. Thanks to, so many thanks to PBS for funding this effort, and you'll see the funder at the beginning of the, uh, of the program later on. Uh, many thanks, too, to our major funders for the local broadcast uh, of the series, Intermountain Gas, and the Idaho State Museum. And thanks too to the museum and all their wonderful staff for hosting us tonight. I hope you've all had a chance to uh, explore the newly renovated museum and all it has to offer. I know I personally think it's truly an extraordinary space that we should all be proud to have here in Idaho. So in addition to premiering the first episode of the series tonight, we at Idaho Public Television have produced a number of companion pieces that showcase the impact of Native tribes here in Idaho. We'll be sharing those as well as the full first episode. Tonight's presentation is streaming on Facebook Live. It will also be available on our website, idahoptv.org, um, afterwards, as well as after the series. And the whole series will also be available online after it airs. Now, to tell you all about uh, this and to introduce our guests tonight is Idaho Public Television's production manager and our very talented producer, Aaron Koontz. Aaron. Thank you, Ron. And of course, uh, I'd just like to once again say thank you to our sponsors who help make programs that you see on Idaho Public Television possible. They make sure that we can put on programs just like this one. Intermountain Gas Company certainly helped us with this program as well as the Idaho State Historical Society and of course the room that you are in right now here at the Idaho State Museum. Uh, so for oh, the past I would say month or so, so about 30 days, we had uh, one of the other producers of this series, Tammy Scardino, and I traveled the state to all five of our state's Native American reservations and uh, wanted to talk to them about two topics. There were two topics that are associated with this program that we wanted to, to hone in on. One of those was the economy. And for that, we really wanted to focus in on what kind of impact the tribes have on the state of Idaho. And, and uh, you'll, you're going to find out very quickly, they have a pretty big uh, imprint, a footprint here in the state of Idaho economically. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And also education. Education, of course, is something that's important to the entire state. But there's also some unique things that happen in education across the state on the, uh, on the tribes as well. Uh, so we've, uh, we're going to focus on all five in some videos that we're going to play here in just a moment. And uh, then we'll have uh, some panelists who were very, uh, we were very grateful that they were willing to come all the way here to Boise to the Idaho State Museum to be with us. Let me introduce them to you. Here uh, closest to me is Chief James Allen. He comes to us from up north from the Coeur d'Alene tribe. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. 
Sitting next to him is Yvette Toole. She is with the Shoshone Bannock Tribe. And then there at the end, we have Antoinette Cavanaugh from the Shoshone, Shoshone Paiute Tribe uh, here to talk to us as well. So before we get into this conversation, and by the way, for those who are watching online, you can interact there on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you'll be able to put in a question, and uh, it will get to me up here. So that if you have a question for one of our panelists, uh, please send them over the Facebook page, and we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Also, if you have a question while we're in the discussion part for the people who are in this room, raise your hand. We'll see if we can get some of those uh, answered for you. If you shout them out fairly loudly, you'll probably still hear me reiterate what your question is for the people who are watching online, because they'll be able to hear us through these microphones. So to get things started, we're going to show this uh, first video. It was produced by my uh, colleague, Tammy Scardino, and it uh, focuses uh, on the economy. They're regional economic powerhouses. Well, they offer uh, growth and development opportunities. They make decisions based on the well-being of their people, their land and resources. Idaho's five Native American Indian tribes share much in common from their history to their steadily growing economic footprint. Each of the respective tribes are the top three employers, um, have been for a substantial period of time. Research conducted by Steven Peterson at the University of Idaho's College of Business and Economics is paying off. He's been studying the five tribes for several years. When I was first hired, the economic impact um, was an idea and uh, we felt in working with the five tribes of Idaho that we needed to tell our story and it needed to come from us. The tribes provide an important complement to each of their economies that adds stability uh, to the local economy and provides job creation. Especially when it comes to less populated areas. Take the Kootenai tribe of Idaho for example. Headquartered near Bonners Ferry, one of their main sources of revenue revolves around gaming. The Kootenai tribe attracts a lot of tourists from Canada. They have some of their slot, some of their uh, you know gaming machines are in Canadian dollars, so they're a, they're a tourist mechanism uh, mecca in their own right. The tribe also operates a sturgeon hatchery. There, efforts are made to revive and preserve the white sturgeon population that had been steadily decreasing since the construction of the Libby Dam. It's said the Coeur d'Alene tribe has lived in North Idaho since the beginning of time. The tribe's impact on Idaho's economy comes in around $330 million. First it was farming, a tradition that will always carry on, and then gaming. The community, once having poor access to health care, knows investing in good health makes for a solid foundation. You know, and I remember when the clinic was up on the hill and it was just uh, a small house, and I think they had only one doctor. Now, they have probably, you know, over a dozen providers. So we're continually expanding the services that we're providing for all our tribal members. Their $17.3 million state-of-the-art health facility serves tribal and non-tribal members alike. The Coeur d'Alene tribe aims to be a good neighbor. We're on to different ventures because, you know, the casino isn't it. You know, there's, there's a good direction that council's going towards and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, honored to be a part of that. It was the well-known Chief Joseph who fought for his land practically to his death. His spirit can be found in his people today in Lapway, Idaho. The Nez Perce tribe is continually one of the top three employers in their region. Being an entity of uh, a sovereign Indian nation, you know, it, it has certain comparative advantages that you know, no one else in our business environment has access to. The Nez Perce Fisheries Program is one of the largest in the United States. Operating on a $20 million annual budget, the $16 million expansion of the casino completed in 2013 up the ante, plus the founding of the Northwest Indian College. What's next? The metal manufacturing industry, 61 acres east of Lewiston, has been secured for the development of a business industrial park. 
Um, it's a solid business for us. You know, it reduces the cost for the local producers and, and their savings, you know, it goes directly to their bottom line. It's a win-win situation, you know, that has existed um, for a lot of years, but nobody's taken advantage of. The Shoshone-Bannock tribes, with approximately 5,800 members, maintain the largest land-based tribe in Idaho. A brand new casino with a bingo hall and slot machines is set to open in 2018. Tourist foot traffic is expected to go up, and even more so down the road with future projects, like a total revamp of their Interstate 15 on and off ramps, a water park, and a golf course. I definitely seen before my own eyes the growth and with that a lot of outside uh, city counties are interested in hey how could we also assist you because you know again you know when it comes to job growth we need the plumbers the electricians the carpenters um, the specialized uh, you know workers that sometimes maybe we may not have at that time. According to the 2014 study, the Shoshone Bannock tribes contribute $400 million annually to the Southeast Idaho economy. I just don't think people truly understand what Fort Hall is all about and what economic impact they have on Southeastern Idaho. 40% of visitor traffic to the Shoshone Bannock tribes casino came from out of state, thus attracting new money into the region. We have nearby cities where our kids are going to public school, we're shopping and we're spending our money in our nearby cities, and we've never been part of the discussions when it came to what they can do. And what we're saying is, hey, with this says, for example, you know, we're, we're looking at family-oriented economic growth. The Duck Valley Indian Reservation straddles the Idaho-Nevada border on the southwestern corner of the state. Here, ranching, hunting, and fishing are the main sources of revenue for the Shoshone Paiute tribes. While balancing elk and antelope herd numbers, they've started offering a select few guided elk and antelope hunts each season. This is a reservation that is closed to anyone but tribal members. They opened up our lands to, um, to guided elk hunting, and this is our second year, and it's proven to be a wonderful success. A secret only a handful seem to know about in the western part of the Gem State and beyond. By the end of 2018, the combined fishing, camping, and guided hunt total comes in upwards of $200,000. Farming also remains a part of daily life for the Shoshone Paiute tribal members due to their rural location alone. Well, we got to protect our water, our, our lands, you know, our crops, fields, our native, you know, native grasses are, we, we got to protect our earth here and keep it clean. With the new headquarters completed just a few years ago, the Tribal Council looks to their future with a desire to branch out into the gaming industry one day, further diversifying their economic footprint. Um, the tribes have so much to offer, you know, to, to Idaho's economy and um, it's time that Idahoans embrace that. All right, there you go. Of course, there's a lot of information in there that uh, didn't get to, into these short, short videos. We'll have another one here in just a moment on education, but we we're, want to start off with the, the economy. And uh, I guess my first question is, uh, the, the tribes do have quite a big footprint when it comes to the state of Idaho and the economy. Why is that important to get that message out to the rest of the state? Yeah, I can, I'll, yes. I'll start, I can start off. Um, it's a, it's a, big, uh, a big important message because a lot of people, when I first started in the tribal politics, uh, one, of my, one of my issues was it, let us make your own decision about tribes and not what somebody told you about. And one of our big issues is um, is being a good neighbor. We have always, um, we're just like anybody else. We're just like any other idol, and we want good schools, we want good jobs, we want good health care for, for our kids and for our people. And so that's when our, when our tribal elders, uh, you know, 30 years ago sat down and said, what can we do to help uh, our tribe? And Indian gaming came, came about that we, we, went, we went that direction and we did that. Because, and now we're the second largest employee in North Idaho. Uh, and we spend, uh, 
a, a lot of businesses are in, in the business to make money. We're in it to help people. You know, one of the things that we do is healthcare. And when we opened our healthcare facility, we, we did it on a sliding scale to help. Uh, and when you're in rural North Idaho, you, there's not a good hospital. You have to drive an hour. And so we wanted to help all the elders, not only our elders, but the elders from the from our from our neighbors. And so that's what that's why we wanted. That's why that message is important to us to to get out. Antoinette, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I'd like to say that one of the challenges of um, of building up your community is also making raising the awareness of the outside community is about your versatility in um, economic development. We know that through the, the continuous improvement and um, education of our kids, building economies is something that will make children use their, their skills to work. Um, when we don't have the awareness out in the larger community that our tribes do have contributions to make to the, the state, um, there is a perception that um, Native Americans do not work. They don't um, look for ways to build their communities. They, th there's a lot of negative perception. And I, I'm hoping that through this process and others, Idahoans come to embrace the Native people that, are, that have been here for, for centuries and um, understand that we, too, have a stake in a future that makes our kids and our community is strong. I should probably point out for those who may not uh, have understood that we're, uh, Stephen Peterson, who's at the University of Idaho, put out a study back in 2014 that kind of talked about the five tribe economic impact on the state of Idaho. And so he's now working on a, uh, another one of those that will be released at some point early next year. So he felt it was probably pretty timely to go ahead and talk about this subject as we move forward. Um, Yvette, I know that you do a lot with, with, with education, but we heard from uh, Randy L. Teton, who's the uh, tribal spokesperson in the Shoshone-Bannock uh, tribes, uh, about some of the things that are coming uh, to uh, Fort Hall and uh, Eastern Idaho. And I imagine that there is a lot that the Shoshone-Bannock tribes can offer to the economy in Eastern Idaho. I think that's something that um, has not been emphasized enough because the the reservation economy offers a lot to both helping provide governmental services to our tribe, but it also really contributes to our neighboring towns because we have to purchase items from the neighboring towns and people don't recognize that. We have substantial amount of needs, um, supplies, paper, I mean, you name it. And if we don't have it, we're not a big, manufacturer of these types of items on reservation. So we have to go and purchase items from either Pocatello, Blackfoot, or wherever we need it. So I think it's not quite understood that um, we do purchase and, and people buy from us. And I think that's something that um, we certainly can improve our community relations and understanding that, that business relationship that is going on between the um, Fort Hall community and our neighboring communities. It seems, and we, when we spoke to Alonzo Colby over with the Shoshone Bannock tribes, one of the things that he was talking about was seeing a little bit more of an, of an across the border economic development plan with uh, neighboring uh, communities. So in Fort Hall, it would be uh, Blackfoot, Pocatello, Chubbuck, uh, even as far north as Idaho Falls. Uh, do you see that that's, that's true on all of the, all the reservations that are trying to get more of a, a foothold into the neighboring communities and saying, hey, we're part of the community, please include us. H how do we get involved? That's, you're hit, you hit it right on the, the bullseye. We have, um, we're, we're part of the, the local um, business associations in, in Coeur d'Alene. We help actually build the, the, the Chamber of Commerce in Coeur d'Alene uh, with the uh, our, I think our donation came in like a hundred thousand to help build that. You know, so when people people come into Coeur d'Alene, they know that it's the city of Coeur d'Alene, but then there's also the tribal presence. You know, just south of there. So we have always uh, that's been our goal from day one, and and uh, we have a great relationship with both Kootenai and Benoit County in trying to attract businesses to, to our area. 
Yvette, do you have anything to add to that one? Well, I, I think you know, we, our archive also recognizes the value of, of attending um, the business organizations. You know, Randy L. Teton is, is always attending the Rotary Clubs and um, for both Pocatello um, and Idle Falls and even as far to the east as Lava. So, you know, it's something that we are um, trying to build that relationship, but we do have more, more to achieve there. And I think we're, we're moving forward into a much more, um, hopefully a more beneficial relationship on the business side with, with the tribes and other entities, local and at, hopefully at the state level. One of the things that's really, Antoinette, is kind of interesting to me is there's communities pretty close to Plummer and to Fort Hall, but I'm sure there's a little bit of a difference when you get to the Duck Valley Indian Reservation where, you know, if you go north to, to Mountain Home, you, it's about an hour drive. If you go south to uh, Elko, it's about an hour drive. I mean, you guys aren't close to any other communities. How does that impact you uh, economically? I think that's, that's one of the challenges we know that and then you have a, a, a time difference when you head towards Nevada. So, um, so there's a lot of mitigation of, of um, trying to figure out what services you, you can, you can uh, procure from Elko on the Nevada side and then services on the, on the on Mountain Home with the Mountain Home Air Force Base and even, even Mountain Home, the city of Mountain Home. But I think the other piece too is um, the, tri the Shoshone Paiute Tribes does a lot of work with governmental agencies in doing uh, land reclamation when, there's, when there are fires. So there's a, actually a collaborative to raise native species to reseed these um, fire devastated uh, areas. And, and actually the kids in the schools learn how to cultivate those uh, native species to uh, rehabilitate those burned areas. And um, so, so there are these, these opportunities for collaboration, not only with business, but other governmental agencies that bode well for the population um, that live in Idaho, for, for all Idahoans. We did have a question out here from the audience. Um, we'll start over here. Go ahead and shout it, and I'll probably repeat it as well. These microphones don't go over, I don't think, the speakers. Uh, okay. I, I apologize. There's, there's don't either. They're just going to the web, the people who are watching online. Oh, okay. Okay, do we have another question? Go ahead. My question is, yeah, uh, can you use your teacher voice? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I, think, I think he means the out, outside voice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Was there any other questions out here? Go ahead. So the question is, what kind of obstacles are in the way of the tribes when uh, neighboring communities try and, and sway things as they're, as they're working on economic development? Is that? Yeah, specifically. Yeah. Go ahead. I think a big part of it is there is a fear of working with tribes. There is a, a, a huge misunderstanding that the reservation has a definite wall and that there's um, a reluctance to overcome that and and there's a need for us to create bridges on the on the business side I think a part of it is that because it's federal lands because it's trust lands reservation lands there are some some limitations that the reservation or tribes that have to overcome but I really think a lot of it is simply misunderstandings and and that um, cultural misunderstandings, business misunderstandings. I'll take a different, uh, a different approach. I think uh, a lot of people mistake that tribes are way in the Stone Age and in the past, uh, but tribes are multi-million multi dollar businesses now. Mm -hmm. And we, we have contractors lining up, we have businesses lining up, they, they want to do business with the tribe. And we are, we are a good partner and we keep our word and so we we hadn't had that uh, issues of uh, you know community local communities uh, you know they 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 want our business and and so that and like I can speak for all the tribes we are multi million dollar businesses and we are business oriented tribes we're not in the stone age 
And so I think uh, that's kind of a misconception that was, might have been like 40 years ago, you know, but I think that's, that has changed, uh, you know, especially like with the Seminole tribe in Florida, they, they own Hard Rock Cafe, you know, we're, you know, tribes are, tribes are part of, you know, living that American dream. Yep. I think also another thing that, um, need, that needs to be out there is um, Native American students are progressing in their academic studies and their professions, their professional studies, and they're looking at ways to then contribute back to the tribe and to develop industry and business. And that is huge. That, and I think we're, we're at the edge of a landfall. In a, line, a landfall in mean, meaning that we're going to see a lot of people take off with business and industry on the reservation. There, there are a lot of farmers that are now looking at agribusiness processes that will benefit the tribe holistically. They're looking at ways to specialize in certain markets to, to bring about um, clean, you know, clean, clean meats. Um, there are, there are a lot of, um, when you look at the high desert of Nevada um, on the Duck Valley Indian Reservation, people raise quality alfalfa and quality beef without chemicals. Now think about that and think about the future. That is very cool. Uh, just a reminder for those who are maybe in the room having a hard time hearing, we are going to post, we are recording this session and we'll post it up on our website as well. So if there's something you missed, uh, you can go back and, and watch this. This is also true for those who may be just joining us online. This will be available on our uh, Idaho Public Television Facebook page and um, online on our website as well. Uh, let's, let's take one more question, then we'll move on to the next topic. You know, I can't think of a better transition if we talk to you about education. Yeah. The question for those who are watching online was uh, whether or not some of the monies that come from the casinos go towards helping the education side of that. We'll let you guys answer that and then we'll, we'll play our next video. So I think um, we, I agree. There is a, a huge problem with um, providing uh, quality certified teachers and especially on the reservation. Um, we, we acknowledge that that is a, one of our huge challenges and one of our goals is to help provide more certified teachers to, for our local schools. The tribes um, provides quite a bit in tribal scholarships to our students. Um, we do have a, a, an increase in tribal students who are attending colleges. However, that is a huge need for us. We, we, we have a very small handful, if even that, of tribal members who are certified teachers. And that's something that we are hoping to, to really help provide more teachers. Um, we recognize that having those tribal students become certified teachers can then um, reach out to our, to our younger generations and can provide that culturally appropriate teaching methods and can really help our students. But yeah, that's a huge problem for the tribes as well. Um, we recognize that and we do provide tribal scholarships from gaming funding, so. So I think it's important to keep in mind when you, when you talk about highly qualified teachers and the lack thereof, that's a national issue. It's not just, um, it doesn't just exist in Indian country. It's a national issue. And it, it goes hand in hand with um, teachers having to pursue and, and obtain their Bachelor of Arts and their science degree, um, then deciding where they want to work. And they're going to go to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. They're not going to stay in locations where they don't have competitive 
a, a competitive edge. It just is the way that it is. Um, when you have uh, scientists, biological sciences, scientists who are making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, is, are, you know, is is a teacher going to stay in that profession and be a teacher, or are they going to become a biology teacher at a university or a scientist at a chemical plant or something like that? So I think that's a national issue. What tribes are doing, what, what the Shoshone Paiute tribe is doing, is they do provide um, educational scholarship to um, students who are pursuing their education, but they're not all going into teaching. Mm -hmm. They're going into those fields where they know they're going to have a job. And they're, they're typically now, what I'm finding in my work that I do with all Western Shoshone tribes in Nevada, is they're going into exactly what that video showed. Plumbers, welders, electrical technicians. Those people go to a two-year program and they're making sixty-five to eighty thousand dollars a year. Teachers go to a four or five-year program and they're making forty. Understand that that's a disparity. People are making different career choices. So people need to take a hard look at that from an educational perspective. And then you're looking for highly qualified teachers to go out to the rurals. That's a challenge. Duck Valley is 100 miles from nowhere. <laughs> OK? So with that being said, um, the students in, in Duck Valley or, or on the Shoshone Paiute tribes are educated by the Elko County School District. I used to be the superintendent for Elko County School District. Um, the challenge therein is not only getting the highly qualified teachers to come to a school district the size of Elko County, which was 17,000 square miles, the challenge was getting teachers to go to Oahe, Duck Valley, and teach on the reservation and stay for a while. Because you know, if any of you know children, you have to build up your trust relationship with those kids to get those kids then to trust you to educate them. It just is the way it is. So um, Elko County does provide um, isolation pay. They get a little bump in their check and they get a $10,000 signing bonus now to go work in Hawaii. I think that'll be very apparent in this video. So let's go ahead and play that. Uh, but before we go to that, if you're having a hard time hearing, we do have a few seats right up here in the front. So all the videos playing, you might want to come up here if uh, you're having a hard time hearing way, way in the back. Let's go ahead and play this next video on education. If you look at the five towns where each of the tribal headquarters are, Fort Hall, Owahi, Lapway, Plummer, and just outside Bonners Ferry, the population is small. The eco economic development on reservations is low. Why is that? Because most reservations are removed from, especially in the state of Nevada, they're removed from economic centers. The educational challenges the tribes face, I think, is related, closely related to the poverty that they've had. Um, one nice thing about the economic development is the tribes have been able to take you know, their own future in their own hands and develop educational opportunities. The tribes face a problem common in small remote towns. Because funding is tied to the number of kids in school, small schools often have less money. It's hard to recruit highly sought after teachers. That's not to say they don't have qualified teachers, but recruiting and retaining good teachers can be a struggle. We live out in a rural area and it's really hard, one, to retain teachers, we can't pay them. Like the education system just sucks when you have a, a large turnover of teachers who stay here for a couple of years and there's just nothing to retain them. Each of Idaho's tribes tackle education in a different way. Most utilize the public education system offered by the state. On the Duck Valley Indian Reservation, students on the Idaho side of the reservation attend school at the Owyhee Combined School, just a few miles over the state border in Nevada. The nearest city is more than an hour away, so this school is the only choice for students. It takes a certain type of person that will be willing to live 100 miles away from a movie theater or McDonald's or you know shopping it's it's definitely a, a challenge 
One of the ways the district is trying to get kids to value education and college is getting the kids out of the small community, introducing them to off-reservation experiences. The kids deserve every opportunity possible because they, you know, it's just different when you live a hundred miles away from things that other kids have available to them outside of school. I know it works. I, I saw it myself when I taught here for 10 years. The difference it made, the hope, the opportunities that it opened when, when the kids were able to leave the classroom and expand that experience. The effort is paying off. More kids are graduating high school today, and a few more are applying for college each year. This is, this is a hard fact. We had 17 students graduate from high school last year here at Owyhee at the Duck Valley Indian Reservation. Seven of those students are in college right now, either in um, a college setting or a university setting. This year, that number is up. 39 students are in college or university. Some of those are adults who decided to get a college degree of some sort. While many of the tribes utilize state-funded schools on the reservations, in Fort Hall, the Shoshone-Bannock tribes have been operating a combination of a public elementary school alongside a tribally operated junior-senior high school. Education has come a long way um, with the addition of uh, the junior and senior high school. Um, it's been here probably going on 10 years now. And then we have a public school at the Fort Hall Elementary. The junior senior high school provides education for students that have a desire to be immersed in their heritage. The tribe makes an effort to hire native teachers and classes often use native art and language. It's an environment that's tailored to be comfortable to Native American students. And what is working is we have uh, dedicated teachers and um, they can only do so much though, it, it can only go so far. We don't have enough native teachers. We do not have enough qualified um, tribal members who have the degree and who are certified to teach either at elementary or at the higher levels. Because you, um, you can't have a successful student unless you have a good teacher. We, we need more funding, we need more opportunities to give that to those students, to each student. While the core classes like math, English, science, and history are provided and meet state standards, the junior senior high school doesn't offer the same variety of other courses that public schools do. We have to cut here, cut there, and, and unfortunately sometimes education takes a back seat. The student right now today will go um, to public school because they, they know they'll get a better education and a better chance at um, any opportunity. Many tribal students in Fort Hall attend public schools in nearby communities. In Lapway, the Nez Perce tribe has been busy dialing in public education to include cultural identity into the courses it provides to students. So as you're going through public education, you're not learning about the history of the indigenous folks um, in this country. You're, you're learning about um, what the state wants you to learn and what the federal government wants you to learn. Angela Picard works at the Northwest Indian College in Lapway, an accredited college based in the Pacific Northwest. Like any college, we have core requirements that every student has to take. For, for our core requirements, they're taking classes like Introduction to Cultural Sovereignty, Reclaiming Our History, um, Icons of Our Past, um, Educating Our Own. The student is, is going back and maybe learning those things that they didn't learn in public education. Northwest Indian College offers Native students from all federally recognized tribes in the U.S. a resident tuition rate that's cheaper than most other universities and colleges. The Nez Perce tribe does recognize that not all students will go to Northwest Indian College. So they work out agreements with nearby colleges in Idaho, Washington, and Montana to offer tribal members in-state tuition. The Shoshone-Bannock tribes are working on a similar goal. Idaho State University has agreed to offer tribal members tuition at $60 a credit starting in June of 2018. Education department has had an increase in student um, enrollment as of this semester. 
Um, I was told it's about 5,000% higher this year than it was last year this time. The Idaho State Board of Education could expand that agreement to include tribal students at all state universities and colleges. And hopefully in the next year we can be able to provide this, the same um, reduction in college tuition to all tribal students. Every tribe in Idaho is improving. Test scores are up, the go on rates are improving, and more college students are getting their degrees. Yeah, I, this would be an opportunity for Idaho to be a leader, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, Indian education, you know, statewide, that uh, uh, in terms of um, creating education opportunities, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about what's going to happen in the next year. I had the opportunity a couple of years ago to work on a program that you can still watch today if you Google Journey to Opportunity. It focused on Native American students uh, in high school across the state. And I can tell you that some of those Native American students are some of the brightest, most uh, dedicated students I have ever seen. But along those routes, there was one thing that I, because due to time, I didn't really get too much into it, but Yvette, one of those things I thought was very important was why the Shoshone Bannock tribe felt it was important to have a junior, senior high school operated and run by the tribe versus just utilizing the public school districts. So I think one of the, one of the strongest things about the uh, Shoshone Bannock high school is that it is a school that really helps reinforce our unique cultural traditions in it. You know, it, as, as the um, video stated, we do follow and we do provide the, the classes um, consistent with the state curriculum requirements, but we also offer additional classes. Um, we have Shoshone and we have Bannock classes that is offered to the students. Um, and in the past year, we have really expanded our curriculum to include um, the technical side, because we recognized or the, the, um, the administration at, sh at the high school recognized that not all students will go to college and that we needed to prepare them for employment purposes. So they provided a, a new fields program that helps them give the basics of welding, electrical, um, some of the carpentry, so that they can start getting into those entry level classes, um, trade, trade trades that they can really go out and be prepared to help pro provide for themselves and their families. So I think that was one of the um, biggest changes that we've seen in the past year is that we now see students who go to public school who want to come and, and attend those classes at Shoban School. Um, so we're starting to see that change where instead of, you know, the, the Shoban School having just the small um, populations. We're, we're now seeing that those populations increase because those are classes that are not provided in the public schools. Antoinette, uh, you spoke about the difficulty of getting some of the teachers uh, to teach out at, at uh, Owyhee because of its distance. What would you say in your mind though is the biggest holdback for students graduating high school and then making that transition into higher ed? I think there are a number of, bar number of barriers that impact them. Number one would be the financial, lack of financial support. Most of the students who live on the reservation, and, and that is changing, um, live at or below the poverty line. So to get them to, to realize that this is, this is a way to change your life, um, sometimes they, they, they don't quite believe that until they, they get out there and they do it. Um, that's the number one barrier. When they leave Duck Valley, understand you're leaving your home, you're leaving your family, you're leaving your family network. So in the work that I do now, my job is to help build those networks for them and with them so that when they make that transition, they have staying power. Last year we had, so it's phenomenal. These kids are brilliant, just like you said. We have a young man who graduated. I'll brag about him for a minute. Just graduated from high school year before last. Um, got accepted to Stanford. Okay. He speaks Shoshone. He speaks Paiute. 
He writes Shoshone, he's learned the orthography, and he was at the ACES conference last year, the American Indian Science and Engineering Symposium. He is writing a computer program for an app so that when people want to speak Shoshone, they have an app that will help them do that. Wow. So our kids, we have a brain surgeon that just graduated a couple of years ago. We've got teachers. We're starting to see a change. But that was through a partnership. There's a company, I won't name them here, but there's a company that went, you know what, we're a pretty well-known company. We have a lot of um, business going on in Nevada. We want to work with the Aboriginal people of Nevada in this area, and that was the Western Shoshone tribes. They entered into a collaborative agreement to um, emphasize social responsibility. And what they've done is they've offered a lot of programs to kids and um, communities to help them, not with a handout, but a hand up. And it's working. It's working. And it's phenomenal what is happening, especially with young children who are becoming adults and are becoming self-sustained. Fantastic. Chief Allen, we're just about out of time, but I do want to ask you this question. Kids on reservations can graduate high school. They can go on and get their high, uh, the higher education degrees. But what if there aren't jobs for them back on their reservations or where they want to be when, they're, when they graduate? And how do you overcome that, that barrier? We have overcome that barrier by actually sitting down with these students uh, before they go to college and say, we need doctors, we need lawyers, we need uh, judges, we need police officers. And we, we actually try to, because we had, at one time we had a bunch of students going to college, uh, myself included, I wanted to be a teacher. That was, what, that was, my, that was my goal in life, was to be a, a history teacher. Um, but then, you know, somebody talked to me and said, you really want to be a history teacher? You know, that's a tough feel, you want to be a teacher? And, uh, and uh, you know, I still may go back. I still may, may, may go back and get my teaching certificate. Uh, uh, but I went into uh, I went into politics, political <laughs> science, and got my degree in that. Uh, but 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 education is my heart, and I, I think we need to. Uh, the the big barrier is teaching our kids that self confidence. A lot of these kids who come from broken homes, come from uh, tough conditions, they come from uh, small schools, and they just don't have that self confidence to. Um, to believe in themselves. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do at our tribe is getting these kids to believe in themselves to, to do it. Because we do have, like she said, we have a lot of success stories. You know, I got, a, a, you know, we have a tribal member that went to Brown at undergrad and got a JD in his, uh, his, in his uh, MBA at Stanford. And, you know, we got doctors, you know, you know obviously we want them to come home and, 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 and share that knowledge, you know, but, you know, but, you know, they're out there, you know, making their way in the world. and. Uh, you know we're very proud of them and uh, we'll continue to that's our goal that was that was our goal of our ancestors is to get our kids to um, to take care of our own so very nice well you know these are uh, great panelists and I'm thankful that they came out here to be a part of this and as you can imagine there's a lot that's left unsaid and I wish we had all the time in the world that we could sit there and discuss for another hour or two. Again, for those who are watching online, we're going to be ending the live stream right now, but if you missed the first part of it, uh, we'll be posting this up. I would look for that maybe by tomorrow morning and then you'll be able to share it on Facebook and uh, also on our website. And for those who are here in the room, uh, we're going to show you that first episode, the first hour of Native America and so uh, we're going to let you play that. And then after that, we're basically done. So at that point, we'll have a few minutes to mix and mingle. There's still some food and drink there at the back of the room. So feel free and help yourself to that.